About a decade ago, I had just finished my graduate degree in piano performance, and I really wanted to start writing and recording my own music. And the world of electronic music and synthesis and sound design was really intriguing to me, even though I had little to no idea how that kind of music was actually made. So I started playing around with synthesizers, but much to my surprise, it was a bit more challenging than I thought, because I quickly started to realize that a synthesizer is not a piano, and while that might seem fairly obvious to most of you, when you spend most of your life learning the intricacies of one single instrument, it can be kind of difficult to break out of just trying to replicate things that that instrument does really well. That might be the reason that any classically trained pianist, when exposed to a synth for the first time, tries to play a classical piano piece on it somewhat poorly. Because both instruments have keyboards, most of the time, we pianists naturally try to draw some sort of parallels. But as I came to find out, this is actually doing a disservice to both instruments. If I can act as a bit of a classical apologist for a second, I think it's important to realize that for us, it's been mostly about learning everything technical about our instrument of choice. This is done through an incredible amount of repetition so that our hands become strong enough and have enough dexterity to handle any wide variety of things that a composer might throw at us. And eventually it becomes almost second nature and we're able to learn things much more quickly because we've seen similar things before and our hands just kind of know what to do. This is called muscle memory. And while we do grow accustomed to dealing with new challenges with every new piece that we learn, there is one constant that, for the most part, really doesn't change a whole lot. And that would be the sound, the timbre, and the general sonic characteristics of how our instrument responds. And while we spend years learning how to get the most expressive range and range of colors that we can out of our instrument, there's a pretty well-defined limitation. A piano is pretty much going to sound like a piano, and is pretty much going to react to our input like a piano. And that's kind of the one cornerstone that we can rely on. And here's where things get kind of tricky. Synthesizers pretty much throw all of that out of the window. And suddenly we have tremendous amounts of control over the sound itself. Now, as an organist as well, I was used to having different stops that all produced different colors. And when you combine those in different ways, they create a whole range of more orchestral possibilities. So maybe that gave me a, just a tiny advantage in learning about layering sound design and thinking of sound design as almost an orchestral process. But in spite of having all of these different colors and combinations of colors, the organ is also very limited in the way that it responds to your input. Unlike a piano, the organ has no velocity control. It doesn't matter how firmly or how softly you press a key, you're going to get the same result out of it. And this makes the organ basically a big complicated series of on-off switches. Also, unlike the piano, the organ has no natural decay, so after you attack a note, it's going to stay at that same sustained level until you release the note. And just like the piano, there's nothing you can do to change that. In synthesis, on the other hand, we not only have control over the sounds themselves through using different waveforms and different wave shapes, we can also change every aspect of the attack, the decay, the sustain, and the release of a given sound. Not only for the overall volume of the synth itself, but also for other modifiers like filters. In synth world, this is called an envelope, or an ADSR, and not only can we set it to however we want it and just forget about it, we can actually program it to change constantly over time. Every one of those aspects. The attack, the decay, the sustain, and the release. This is called modulation, and depending on the synthesizer, it can go incredibly deep, where you have modulators modulating other modulators. And with all of these tools at our disposal, we can create incredibly complex evolving sounds that can actually remain sonically interesting over the course of several minutes with a single key press. <laughs> So this means that sound design is its own skill that exists in some sort of separate 
and parallel world to actually composition with notes and arranging notes in different ways as we more traditionally think of composition. So hopefully you can start to see maybe some of our problems here. Now, as someone who loves finding a memorable melody or harmonic progression through this more traditional form of composition, but also equally has discovered a deep love for sound design and crafting the sounds themselves, this has presented a new world of challenges in how to marry these two things in my own music to achieve some sort of balance. I sometimes feel like I'm focusing too much on one technique at the neglect of the other. It's a bit like trying to decide which of your kids is your favorite. I mean, I don't have kids, but I've heard that's hard. Sometimes I like to just lean into one or the other. While synthesizers are incredibly versatile and there's no right or wrong way to use a synth, these are some of the techniques that I've sort of developed over the years of making my own electronic music that have served me pretty well. Pick a leader. As I've mentioned in some of my other videos, to simplify an overwhelming amount of options, we can impose our own set of limitations. And as this relates to a synth patch, I like to think of it in two different ways. Will I use the sound as color to sort of fill in my outline of notes? This would be more like traditional orchestration. Or will the synth patch itself be the jumping off point for what notes I do and don't use due to its complexity and interest? in and of itself. Maybe it won't be about the notes at all, because maybe this patch can evolve by just holding one or two notes down, and it's more about the notes that I don't put in there so that the patch has room to breathe and develop. To use one last pipe organ example, when we play a large pipe organ in a very large space that has a naturally long reverb tail, we actually have to slow down our playing as an organist and play a little bit more detached so that things don't just become a giant muddy mess. And especially on faster, more intricate, technically demanding pieces, we can actually hear the notes in there to some degree. And I think you can take some of those same principles and apply them to a big ambient synth patch that's drenched in reverb, which I know, we all love to do it. It has to have room to breathe and room to expand, and it should affect your approach to playing it, even if you're playing it with a sequencer. To put this simply, the busier your patch, the more space you have to leave for it. And if you do find that you need something that's capable of handling a lot of notes in a short amount of time, think about the instruments that tend to play really complex passages. What characteristics do they have? You may need to simplify your patch in those cases. For me, it usually boils down to how I want to approach putting a piece together. Take a piece like this one. thing is based around an 8-track tape loop consisting of layers of piano and synthesizers that were mixed in and out in real time. This is how a lot of modern music is put together. Not on tape anymore, but in layers. Stacked layers that kind of come and go over the course of the arrangement. This is an incredibly effective technique, but it's also extremely common. And I think in order to stand out using these sort of techniques, you need to be a sound designer at an elite Trent Reznor-esque level and really bring something unique to the table with the sounds themselves that you're using because this style is often built on repetition and without some sort of sonic interest or development, repetition in and of itself is going to get old eventually. Or you could try a different approach that may seem a little old fashioned, but guess what? Old fashioned means that it has stood the test of time. And I actually think it's a little bit more difficult to pull off but a bit easier to stand out if you can. I'm referring to a more linear style of composition, thinking horizontally instead of thinking vertically.
This track is an example of more linear writing. Much like when writing for an organ or for choir, I'm thinking of each part as a linear melodic idea that, when carefully planned, creates the vertical harmonies, aka chords. That's one way to write more interesting chord progressions that don't just feel like blocked triads that are jumping around randomly. But I kind of digress. You can read my free ebook that looks something like this and is linked in the description if you would like to learn more about the specifics and in-depth techniques that I use to write in this fashion. But as this track develops, you can clearly hear that there's a underlying bed of sound design that swells up gradually and almost kind of swallows the piece whole at the end. But the main focus and what I built the thing around was this chorale-like theme. It may not be readily apparent, but it has structure. It has form. It has this sort of period structure of question and answer going on. But even with this more linear approach, the textures and the patch itself determined some of the choices that I made with the composition. Like, for instance, the tempo of the track. It needed to be slow enough and deliberate enough to reveal all of these subtle changes in the sound design. So this is one of those tracks where I feel like I came very close to marrying kind of these two different concepts and two different worlds that I love equally, a well-crafted linear musical narrative and provocative, evolving, highly textured sound design. Now, I'm not even gonna pretend like I have all of this figured out is something that I still think about every single time I sit down to write something new, because as a composer, I was taught that you shouldn't rely on how beautiful your instrument sounds to prop up poor or lazy writing. This is why more traditional composers will often write at the piano to make sure that their ideas are capable of standing on their own in black and white before they take it and add the color of orchestration. And I still think there's a tremendous amount of truth and value in this approach. However, in the world of electronic music and synthesis and sound design, the rules have changed. The somewhat unwavering predictability that an instrument is always going to sound like itself, for the most part, is no longer the foundation from which to build. And maybe, if the very ground beneath your feet, your foundation is capable of being remolded and completely changed over time, maybe it's okay to sort of relearn how to walk on that ground and maybe redefine what walking is altogether. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it sounded good. If you're a classical musician who has struggled with some of these concepts in electronic music yourself, you can give this video a like, and maybe more classical musicians will get to see it and take something from it. And if you're an electronic musician who's angry at classical musicians for just playing classical pieces on synthesizers, just try to relax and have some understanding for where we come from. We're trying. I promise. If you want to see more stuff about compositionally related topics, which I've really enjoyed talking about lately, as well as synthesizers and stuff, you can subscribe to this channel. I think that's it. Bye!